In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. C.S. Lewis had put it well when he said, Christianity is a statement which, if it is true, is of infinite importance. If it's not true, it's of no importance. The one thing it cannot be is moderately important. And yet I claim that most people plump for the third alternative. And they regard, they put their hope in Jesus for their eternal destiny, and then they look for the world for everything else. And the reason for that in part is because they haven't cultivated and curated an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. That they haven't actually seen that actually we're going to have a short, brief journey in this world. What are the metaphors that scriptures use for us? You're a pilgrim. You're a sojourner. You're an alien. You're a stranger. You're an exile. You're a wanderer. That's a lot of metaphors. It means that your dash between those two dates that we see on a gravestone, whether it is 10 years or 100 years, will make all the difference in the world, and that right now counts forever. But yet, somehow, we put our hope in the eternal because it doesn't seem that's real to us. And the visible is so palpable and tangible. But the more prudent we are, the more we'll begin to measure our lives by what God says is important and to prepare ourselves for our eternal citizenship in the Father's house. There's a, an EMT paramedic named Mash, Matthew O'Reilly who I, I saw this video he did on death and dying. It was, am I dying? The honest answer. And when he would encounter on the road, an accident had taken place. He's the first responder, and he can see certain cases of an impending doom, as he calls them, which means their death will be within a few minutes max. At first, when he asked the question, am I dying, he lied. But then later he says, why don't I give him the gift of honesty? Yes, you are dying. And when that happened, he found that people had three responses to that. First of all, many wanted to express the need for forgiveness. A second need was a need for remembrance. Is there anyone who remembers me? In that last few, just few moments left. And the third one was the need for meaning. Is there anything I can do that's going to last forever? And it's an incre incredibly important idea. Because he's talking about what is life about? Suppose, for example, that you didn't have impending doom, but rather you were given, let's say, one year to live. How would you view your life different? Uh, and you get in other doctors' opinion, they all agree that you have one year. And it, you won't notice the symptoms, but you'll have up to a year and no more. Would that change your schedule? Would it change your priorities? Would it change your perspective? And I claim that the degree to which it would change it is the degree to which you are not embracing a tempor an eternal perspective in this temporal arena. Because we are all transitory. We're all brief. We're all ephemeral in this world. Our days are like a shadow. And when we think about this idea of how the scriptures invite us again and again, teach us to number our days that we may present to thee a heart of wisdom. If you do not live with that in mind, if you do not grasp the brevity of this earthbound sojourn, as George Bernard Shaw so uh, wisely put it, the statistics are impressive. One out of one dies. There's no escape. And so when we look at that, you realize, my word, if this is true, how do I live as if tomorrow might be my last day? Because every day is a short life, isn't it? Today is a, a mini life. It has its birth, it has its growth, it has its day, decay, and it has its death. You, you were birthed this day, awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine. You were, it's like a resurrection from the dead. And then you have your birth, you have your growth. Some of us require more time to get to that maximum point, maybe more caffeine than others, but eventually you grow, and eventually you get a, reach a point of clarity, and then later on, it, you'll start the third phase. You're going to start this very day to decay. Or you may get a second wind, but it's going to get you. And this very night, then, you're going to go to your burial chamber, which is your bedroom. And then you're going to take, and you're going to put on your grave clothes, your PJs or whatever it is that you wear to bed. And you're going to turn out the lights, and in that darkness, you're going to lay on your beer and pull your shroud over your head. And you're going to go into this death-like state that Paul calls sleep, a euphemism for death. That's a strange thought. 
that you are effectively re-enacting re that drama of birth, growth, decay, and death on a daily basis. We see it on an annual basis, and here we have the glory of what I call the spring palette that ravishes me more and more. I look at the beauty of God in the trees. It's an astonishment, and most people don't even notice. But uh, the out external points beyond itself to the internal and reveals the glory of God as a force multiplier for worship and praise. But it's also a reminder of the brevity of the sojourn because just as every day is a mini life, so every year is a mini life, and so is every life, and so every nation and every civilization, they have their cycles. And so we realize then, as the psalmist said, Lord, make me know my end, and what is the extent of my days that I know how transient I am. Behold, you've made my days as hand breaths. He says he desires something more. Surely every man is at his best a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, our Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. And that is the eternal perspective, that radical paradigm shift that's absolutely necessary for us to grasp the reality of this brief world, namely that you need a shift of perspective from an egocentric worldview to a Christocentric, theocentric worldview. Ptolemy was the great uh, Egyptian astrologer, uh, astronomer slash astrologer. They combined them a lot in those days, but essentially the Ptolemaic system was that the, it was, it was geocentric. That is to say the earth was at the center of the solar system. So it wasn't a solar system, it was a, ter a, ter a terrestrial system. And that prevailed for centuries and centuries, in spite of the fact that the scientific evidence began to amass against it, but they came up with all these clever systems of cycles and epicycles to explain retrograde motion of Jupiter and Saturn and so forth. But eventually, a Copernican revolution finally hit. And when that occurred, everything changed, and suddenly we realized it's not the Earth at all, it is, in fact, the sun around the center of the solar system, and we go around that. What's fascinating about my life, and yours as well, every journey you have on this earthly orb around the sun, every annual journey, and you're going about 66,000 miles per hour, every annual journey takes less time than the one before. I've got, I find it goes faster and faster and faster because age conspires with God. You're in a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy because it forces us to recognize that we must transfer our hope from what is passing away, and it becomes obvious, to what's going to endure forever. And that's a hard thing because, you see, we are in a world of sorrow. Things are not meant as, as they were meant to be. It's, uh, it, there's a great loss. There's a great diminishment that we have that we see it, when we look at loved ones. I look at old photographs. On, on, on New Year's Day, uh, I had a time, and I just looked at old photographs. A lot of them I had scanned in the computer, and in reflection, I realized that same nostalgia is actually a longing for a better place. They were, they were never meant to die. They were meant, never meant to go, grow old. Why is it so in this fallen world? And if I begin to realize this earth is designed to treat, teach me how transient, how brief how ephemeral my days are, and to treasure the precious present. The more heavenly minded you are, the more earthly good you will do. It's not the other way around. The more you realize the precious present, as this day is all you have. You do not have yesterday. You, do, you can't count on tomorrow. All you have is this day. And you will either invest it or you will squander it, but you'll never get it back again. So it is so permanent, it's so real, that if we can train ourselves to realize that we are actually spiritual beings. You see, you're an amphibious being. You have one foot in heaven and the other on earth. You are, God defines you as a spiritual being. But you're having this brief, ephemeral, earthbound experience, this transitory experience. And in a fallen world, we see things as are not the, meant, the way they were meant to be. People were not meant to die. They were ne never, and we, we changed ourselves. And I begin to realize then I have a hope more and more. I'm seeking that city and country, that place that God has for us. And you must train yourself to realize how important the precious present really is. 
for Christ to be at the center of that throne so that I move away from my illusory ego ambitions and realize that I must actually see that he has a better plan for me than I would have for myself. And he would call us, me to put my hope in that which is going to endure. So we're in a short world and people age and they die. But I'm seeking to learn with an eternal perspective how to turn nostalgia into joyful anticipation. It's a very interesting process uh, to, to go through. I've been doing this with my wife. And as I see, I was granted this great gift of this fabulous moment with her. Uh, and I, I burned it in my mind. It was in, I'm an old guy. This was in the summer of 67, just before I went off to uh, graduate school at Berkeley, California, the summer of love. So it's very strange. But before we went there, um, I, I recognized the time that I was going to marry this woman. And it was because of her beauty and her brilliance. And so what I now see is that is not nostalgia, but really anticipation. Let me submit to you that the most beautiful moments in a person's life, the, most, the, the, the peak of their, of their greatness, is only a very dim hint of a resurrected wonder that you cannot yet even imagine, but it'll be transcendent. I now see people more and more as they will be. So I treasure her because I see her. I use that, that image in the past as, an, as a slingshot to whom she'll be in the future. And it's changed my view of people because I see them as they are going to be. But why is it though that most people are more willing to put their hope in the present tense and not into the things that are to come? It's because it's not real, it's not palpable to them. Heaven for them is like a kind of a strange nebulous notion where we have some desires and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, it's like the person in a Gary Larson cartoon who's been obviously got his kit. He's got his cloud, he's got his wings. Where do we get this crazy idea we're gonna have wings? Um, Clarence, angel, uh, angel second class, you know, it's a wonderful life, nonsense. Um, but we see, what are the things we see, think of as heaven? And most people's idea of heaven is my idea of a crashing war. You see, I think of heaven as endless creative activity without frustration to the glory of God. I see it as something that transcends my own, my own thin imagination, something that's rich and wonderful. And that as I anticipate that then, I recognize we are being prepared for far more than this world can ever begin to imagine. And so death in a certain sort of way is a negative sacrament. Just as a sacrament is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. So death is an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible invis disgrace. We share the journey of Adam, and it's a deathless, it's, it's a Christless eternity. And yet by his, God's grace, he pursues us, and as a sacred romancer of our souls, woos us, draws us, and, and invites us to know him in a richer way than we could have ever even begun to imagine. So that we need to begin to see that God is the romancer, the one who pursues, underwrites our cost, and makes it possible for us now to be acceptable in the sight of God, not by our works, but because of what he underwrote. To make it possible for you and me then to reflect and reflect, refract the glory of Christ in a way that no one else can even begin to do. So the heart's deepest longings are there. A.W. Tozer put it this, this, this way. He said, the days of the years of our life are, are few and swifter than a weaver's shuttle. Now think about this in an agrarian world before we had these kinds of technologies. What, how would you describe time going forth really fast, time just moving quickly? Best way you could do it, with a weaver's shuttle. Have you ever, how many of you have been to a weaver's shuttle and you see how they push down the loom and then shoot the shuttle across? Fascinating to watch. And so in that metaphor taken from Job, each day is like that, where you push down the loom and then shoot the shuttle across and then push down the loom and shoot it back across and day after day shows fast forward, you see. Swifter than a weaver's shuttle. He says, life is a short and fevered rehearsal we cannot stay to give. Just when we've attained proficiency, we're forced to lay our instruments down. There's not enough time to do all that we know our capabilities are there. And I'm beginning to realize, I'm old enough to realize that most of my life is well behind me. But you see, we're all in our last days. It's just a moment, it's ephemeral, and unless I train myself to treasure 
the precious present and live only with two days in my calendar. There are two days that I have is this day because I do not have yesterday and I cannot count on tomorrow. This day is all you have and the more you live this day in the light of that day, the richer your life will be. So that, I, the day, that day is the day when I stand before Jesus and give an account. And when I see him, I'll realize this is the one that is the wellspring of all beauty and goodness and truth. But may I train myself, may you do so, to come to have a holy longing and aspiration for a realm in which we will be resurrected and the world around us will be given a new resurrection and our experience of space and time will even be doxological. It will no longer take our lives away but actually be something which you can luxuriate and use. I'm very excited about a whole lot of things. I have a feeling we'll be able to zoom down order, orders of magnitude and back out again. What a ride I think it will be. But why don't we long for that? We need to train ourselves to long for the tearless, painless, sorrowless, world of, that is prepared in resurrected bodies in a resurrected world where we become gardeners of the new creation and that is to me a, 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 a rich a vision of what life was really meant to be uh, all the way around when I think about the precious present I think about our, our town Thornton Wilder's play and I remember how Emily uh, one of the dead is, is invited to have one day to go back and revisit and this, the, the, the dead say, don't choose a big day. Any day would be big enough. Because when you see it from an eternal perspective, you'll realize how precious it was and how much you missed. Do, and she then is overwhelmed through her tears when she sees all that she had missed. And she says, do any human beings ever real life, life, realize life while they live it? Every, every minute. I do believe that the more you have an eternal perspective, the more you'll tre treasure the precious present. And you'll be a person who lives with vitality and fullness. Because you see, we're called to then pursue those things that God declares to be important. To treasure the invisible, the unseen over the, the visible. It, it might be well said that everyone ought to fear to die until they've done something that will always live. And I think that God has wired you and I to desire something more than this world offers. As the story of the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2 illustrates, the world pours out its best wine, and what does it do then? It switches to the cheap stuff after people's discernment has been dulled. That's what the world does. And it gets thinner and thinner, and the promises that drove us when we realize it's not what it was all cracked up to be. Destination sickness, and you realize that wasn't enough. There's got to be more. But I claim that our Lord's miracle of turning the water into wine teaches that for those who follow him, the best is reserved for last. He's saving the best for last. But here's the, the, the paradigm shift I must make, I think, every day. Who's on the throne of my life? Who gets to decide? When I use the Lord's Prayer as part of my routine, I think about the, the, the Father in heaven. It starts with him and not with me. Hallowed be your name. Your will be done, you see, your kingdom come. It's about his name, about his will, and about his kingdom. Not about my little reputation. Not my little desires and devices and not about my rule, my fiefdom, but it's a transfer and the realization that I must, I must decrease and he must increase. And when you find that happening, the more you find you live, giving it over to him, the holy relief is that you discover that you have everything else thrown in with it. Because I believe that the things we naturally pursue, significance, security, satisfaction, are not found in the things that this world offers us, but rather they're the byproducts, the overflow of the pursuit of the one thing most needful, the pearl of great price, the treasure hidden in the field. When you treasure this thing, everything else is thrown in. So seek the world and you'll miss out on everything. Seek heaven first and you'll th find that the joys of this world are found in it. So how do we train ourselves? How do we desire more? Our problem is we desire too little, not enough. Um, our, 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 our desires are too thin. As C.S. Lewis puts it in The Weight of Glory, he says, if anything, it's not, it, our, our desires are, are too anemic, he says. We're half-hearted creatures. 
fooling about with money, drink, and ambition, when the infinite joy is offered, it's like an ignorant child in a slum who's willing to go on making mud pies because he cannot ma imagine what is meant by an offer of a holiday at the sea. We're too easily pleased. What I'm claiming is that most people don't long for enough. What do you seek? The first question Jesus asked is the most important thing because you become conformed by that to which you aspire. You are shaped by your values. So what do you long for more than anything else? And if it's not that which is trans-temporal and trans-finite, it's not big enough because you've made us for yourself, as Augustine said, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. So as we pursue him, we discover that by pursuing Jesus first, give me Jesus, that wonderful intro. Wasn't that beautifully done? It, it moved my, whole, my soul because you make you realize my word we have, this is what we need. This is essential. It comes down to the simplicity and purity of devotion to him, to know him, to pursue him above all other goods. Guess what happens? He'll throw in security, significance, and satisfaction as the overflow, the byproduct of the pursuit of him above those goods. You'll never find them by seeking them, but you'll find them as the overflow of seeking him first and everything else is thrown in. So that really, if I had to summarize the message of the Bible, it might be, I'm God and you're not. Not a bad way. See, if you want to hear God laugh, tell him your plans. If you hear him laugh even more, tell him how much you know. The fact is that we are called to have a pursuit of him, that pursuing those things that are huge and rich and wonderful. But to understand the world for what it is, take it correctly. Uh, a friend of mine describes life as a brief, uh, a brief stay in a hotel. How many of you have been in flea bags in the past and sometimes, but you'll put up with it because you're not gonna, that's not your home. I've had a lot of hellacious places like that. And then there are other places, uh, a five-star boutique hotel, and it's a lovely thing and everything's provided for you. It's a wonderful place to be, but it's still a hotel. And so that's why you don't like the decor. You don't need to make it. You're living out of a suitcase. So understand, you're not going to change those things. It's to hold it with a loose enough grip because no matter what the hotel's rating, we're living out of a suitcase and it's, we know it's not our home. And so God never meant room service as a substitute for good home cooked meals. You see, you can't live on room service alone. You get the analogy, we are in a flea bag hotel, this world has fallen, and yet the same, it's glorious and wonderful, but it's in, what, in comparison to what's coming, you haven't seen anything yet. And so if we have a, uh, though we have no memories of heaven, we can exchange our currency for that heavenly currency that will endure, that will last, that will thrive. A friend of mine put it this way, write your obituary now and see if it will play well in heaven. Not a bad question. And the question, or another way of putting it, what are you taking under your arm to the ultimate show and tell? The idea, if I live today, which is all I have, and you, all you have, in light of that day, the day of Christ, could it be for you the world's last night? Could it be that if you were to live in such a way that you knew, let's say at midnight tonight, you'd be with Jesus? I think that would animate, energize, and enhance your capacity for living with a fruitful life, a fulfilling life, a life where we can choose the way of gratitude rather than grumbling, a life where we can choose the way of contentment rather than complaining, where we can choose to pursue those things that will endure and we'll find that even the best things are hardly even imaginary in comparison to what he's got for us. The reality is that we don't long for enough. And my prayer for you is that you would come to ask this question, what do you seek? And fill it in. And if it's not big enough, you're, you're putting your heart in something that's beneath the dignity of the new person you've become. Don't sell yourself cheaply for the empty trinkets of a fallen world, but pursue the thing most needful. I seek you, and if, by your grace, I want to know you. And so by pursuing that, and if you cannot say, what do you want more than anything else? I want you more than anything else. Can you say, I want to want you more than anything else? Start where you are, not where you aren't. He can't multiply nothing. But you give him something. I want to want you. That will be enough. And because it's not perfection, but holy intention that pleases the heart of God. So for a person to have an aspiration, an a, an, a desire, a, indeed a passion, a passionate longing for more, 
then that understanding is minimized, you see. We have to long for so much more we realize only he can sustain it. So my desire for you is that you would trust the Father, that you would abide in the Son, and that you would walk by the Spirit. Amen.